lesson might seem a little bit out of place for this time of year, right? We're in Epiphany, and this lesson is more often heard in the beginning of the season of Lent. Right, this is the one of the first readings we get in Lent, because it's Jesus being taken into the wilderness by whom? Who takes Jesus to the, to the wilderness? Satan doesn't take him there. Who takes Jesus there? God does. The Holy Spirit takes Jesus to the wilderness, where he fasts for how many days? Forty days. He fasts for forty days. He doesn't eat anything for forty days. How many of you have gone without food for forty days? <laughs> how many of you have gone without food for a day and a half? Right? It's hard sometimes. And what, what includes food? When we do the 40-hour famine here with the, with, the, with the LYO kids, 40 hours, right? 30. 30. We're going to do 40 now. Apparently. We're going to do 40 now, apparently. So there you go. When we do the 30-hour famine with the kids, we, we, we go through this. Of what, what are you allowed to have? Water. I think in the past we've a lot of had apple juice, maybe even Gatorade. Um, things that allow you still to get some nutrients, right? So that you're not starving. Right? I, I, I drink water when we do the 30-hour famine. It's run through beans. Right? <laughs> That's basically what I have for 30 hours. And it's hard to do that, actually, because they, when, they start, when we start this 40-hour famine, the kids go to school. And they're not supposed to eat lunch while all of their friends sitting around them are eating lunch. Right? So you're watching everybody else eat. And that makes you even that much more hungry. So Jesus is in the wilderness because the Holy Spirit is taking him there. And then after, he's, after he has been there for 40 days, who comes to visit him? It's interesting. Did you hear in the reading this morning? There's two names given. I was wondering as I sat there and listened to Sarah Beth read it, is it two different people? Because the very first thing is, it says the tempter came to him and said... If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, quote scripture, right? You're not supposed to live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And then the devil comes to him. Right? That's what our reading says. Are they one in the same? Are they always one in the same? Maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not. But the devil comes to him and says, takes him to where? The pinnacle of the temple, right? In Matthew. And he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off of this. And the pinnacle of the temple in that, that day and time was thought to be the, the most highest point on earth. That was the point where heaven and the earth touched was the pinnacle of the temple. So at the pinnacle of the temple, the devil takes Jesus and sits him up there and says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself off. Because it says that he will command his angels to, to get you that your, dash, that your foot will not dash against a stone, right? What does that tell us? Why do we need to know Scripture? Why is it important as followers of Christ that we know and understand what the Holy Scripture says? Right. The devil himself knows Scripture well enough to quote it back to you. So therefore, if you do not know Scripture yourself, you're going to hear it and go, oh, okay. Because he's quoting Scripture. So obviously what he's telling me is right. Or correct. Or something that I should do. But what does Jesus say? He says, you're not supposed to, to put the Lord your God to the test. Right? Is that, was that, that's a, is that the quote there? Yeah, that's yes. Or is that the next one? He said, yeah, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the devil takes him up to the high mountain. The top of the mountains. And he shows him all of the kingdoms of the world. And he says... Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of these things. 
right? Now, the, this temptation story comes up twice in the Gospels. Once here in Matthew, which we have this morning, which is bread, temple, mountains. It comes up again in the Gospel of Luke, which has a little bit different order. It's bread, mountains, temple. Does the order mean something? Only to the, to the Gospel writers and to the community at which they're sending it. The big thing we need to understand is what this is actually saying to us. In previous years when I've preached on either the Matthew or the Luke text, I always get happy. I get, a, I get this little cringe of delight in my soul because I get to teach you a Greek word, which I know some of you really don't like, but some of you do. Right? I teach you Greek and Hebrew every now and then, and, one, and I've already taught you this. Do you remember? Right. The word A, I-E in Greek, is the word that is translated here as if. When the devil comes to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread, and you will not be hungry anymore because you can eat. But that word, I-E-A, also means since. So did the devil say, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread, and you'll be able to eat? Or did he say, since you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread? Do you see the difference? Both of them are very, could be very accurate translations of what this text has to say to us this morning. And I don't think that it's the fact that the devil is questioning whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. You see, here's what the devil is actually doing and what the devil does to each and every one of us every day of our lives. The devil is not questioning whether or not Jesus is God's Son. So since you are the Son of God, you, I know you can turn these stones into bread and you can do it. So do it. And since you are the Son of God, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple because the angels are going to come and lift you up so that you don't even hurt yourself. And then when he takes him to the mountain, he says, look at all of this. I will give you all of this. And the question that I have for us before I get to, what, to the reason I think that if is the better translation than since is now. Can the devil give Jesus what he said he was going to in that last temptation? The no. The devil takes Jesus up to the mountain and says, look at all of the kingdoms of the world. I will give them to you if you only bow down and worship me. And that, my friends, is a bold-faced lie. And why I think if is more, uh, is a more better? <laughs> Hold on for a second. Bad English. Why I think if is a better translation than since here, it's not if the devil is questioning Jesus' identity. The devil is trying to get Jesus to question his identity. The devil is trying to get Jesus to question his identity as the living Son of God. And each and every one of us in our baptisms was named and claimed as a beloved child of God. And every day we are hammered by things in our lives that tell us that we're not good enough that we can't possibly do it. That we need to give up and give in to what the world is telling us we need and what we should be. And just like Jesus, we need to remember who God is and who we are in God. You see, Jesus did not overcome these temptations because he had some holy, miraculous power that we don't have. Don't get me wrong, he is God, so he is a little bit better than we are. But he didn't have any other special power that we do than the fact that he knew who he was in God. And by everything questioning his life and everything that the devil could ever say to him, all he has to say is, that's not the way that I understand who I am in my, in my God. Because God has made me perfect to do his will. And that doesn't mean that we, that we coast through life and that everything is great and everything is smooth and there are no troubles. But what that means is when the troubles come, we can lay hold of who we are in God, whose we are, and by that, tell the devil to go away. Like Jesus does in the last temptation. Get away from me, Satan. Because I know who I am in God. 
And because of that, you have no power here. See, that's what God is calling us to be and to do in the world. God has blessed us beyond imagination by naming and claiming us in the font where he baptized us as his own children. So don't lose sight of that. And always remember whose you are. And don't let anyone question your identity as a child of Christ, as a child of God. Because that is the most important thing that any of us could ever have. So hold tight to who you are and whose you are and go into the world knowing that things are going to happen but that God is always there for you and share the love that he's given you so that everyone else can know that even in the darkest valleys there's always a light to shine us through.